Okay, so what is this compassion? Exactly how does it work? Using the thoughts of our left and right brain, okay, that's our logic, driven through the power of our emotion. So remember, emotion is the power system. Thought is the guidance. So we put those together. Using the thoughts of left and right brain, driven through our emotion, how we resolve our feeling world regarding a series of key statements given to us by the Essenes is our code to become compassion in our lives. And what they said to you through their texts was this. They said, we will give you a series of statements. In this case, there are five codes. How you feel, think, and emote about each of those five codes is your path to becoming compassion. As you reconcile each of these five possibilities in your world, then you become compassion. And that is where the science comes from. It's given to us like an equation, and we can actually call this intentional compassion. Webster's Dictionary, very interesting, defines compassion as a quality of sympathy that we have for others in times of need. How interesting. A quality of sympathy. While it may include that, in the ancient traditions, compassion has a much greater breadth. It's more than simply sympathy. It's an awareness. It's a consciousness. It's a state of being that we carry with us. We become compassion. It's not something we do, something we become. We walk it down the streets. We embody it as we dine in the presence of one another. When we sleep, we are compassion. It's intentional rather than allowing it to just happen to us. So the Essenes offered compassion to us as an equation. If this, then this. If you acknowledge, trust, and believe in certain tenets that they will offer to us, then you become compassion. What a beautiful, what an eloquent way to share this ancient wisdom. So I'd like to offer the five Essene codes of compassion. Each one of them could be an entire lifetime worth of work. And they invite us to come to terms with it in a single lifetime. The first code, it simply asked us to acknowledge is there a single source of all that we'll ever witness in our lives, in our world? Is it possible that every life event without exception is part of that source? In these traditions of the mystery schools and of the Essenes, the Egyptian traditions and the indigenous Native American traditions, they offer the possibility that there is a single creative force at work in our world and it has many different expressions many different ways to manifest. There's one force that's out there. If we acknowledge that there's a single source of all that ever is or will ever be, and that every life event without exception is part of that one, then that's the first step toward compassion. The second tenet, if you trust in the process of life as it's shown to you, do you trust in divine timing? Do you believe there are no accidents in this world? Or do you believe, as some bumper stickers and t-shirts say, bad things happen to good people? Things just happen. Do you trust, for example, that every time you kiss your loved ones goodbye and you send them out the door of your house and they go to work or they go to school or they go wherever they're going to go, do you trust that you'll see them again the next time you've planned to see them at the end of the day for dinner or when they come home from school next semester? or when your husband or wife comes home from work, do you trust that? When someone steps onto an airplane to fly somewhere else, do you trust that you'll see them on the other end? Or is the part of you that says, I may never see this person again? How do you feel about that? We must reconcile this in our lives. We're invited to trust in the process of life, allowing for the possibility that what we witness in others doesn't have to be our experience. We have to know that when we're running We've agreed to be somewhere on time. We're running 15 minutes late and traffic just won't let us get there. Maybe there's a really good reason not to be there until 15 minutes later. Maybe there's an accident happening. Maybe there is a, a natural phenomenon occurring and we're invited to allow for this possibility. Again, these are only possibilities. I'm just laying out potentials and possibilities. 
If you believe that each and every experience without exception is your opportunity to demonstrate mastery of life, that's a path. And that's the path that our Western conditioning has invited us to embrace. The possibility that we're all tested every day. A test is part of the linear thinking of the left and the right brain that says you pass or you fail. It's part of that right, wrong, good, bad, light, dark. How do you even know if you pass or fail until you compare your achievements to someone or something else? And then the question arises, who do you compare yourself to? How do you know if you're fat or thin or a good communicator or a good athlete until you compare yourself to someone else? And how could they ever be your yardstick? If you've done the best that you can do and you're comfortable with your achievements. So what if we've never been tested and all of our challenges in lives rather than tests were simply opportunities to demonstrate mastery? That feels very different. In an opportunity, you simply have the opportunity once again to demonstrate your level of development without judging that development as right, wrong, or good, or bad. This has been tremendously healing and it holds the potential for a lot of healing in lives where individuals have been conditioned to be extremely competitive and have always fallen short of the goals that they set in the competition. If you believe that every experience without exception is an opportunity to demonstrate mastery in life. The fourth tenet, fourth code of compassion. If you believe that your life mirrors your quest to know yourself in all ways. So often I hear individuals speaking to me about their desire to find balance. How can you ever find a balance point until you know what the extremes are? Now, it doesn't mean that you must live all the extremes of life to find balance. This is the beauty of the holographic nature of consciousness. Many bodies living in this world and a single consciousness. That means in this consciousness, there's a part of us that already has experienced the darkest of the dark. We don't have to do that individually. There's a part of us that has taken our lives to the extremes, and we don't necessarily have to do that. On the one hand, on the other hand, unless we try something new, how do we ever find that place of balance? When I share this code, I think back the day that I went into my director, my last corporate career in aerospace, and I shared with the director that I was leaving. And the first thing he asked was, well, what company are you going to? And I, I laughed. I said, well, I, I'm not going to a company. I'm going to be an author and write a book. And then he laughed <laughs> and said, sure. He said, you know, if you leave this company, you'll never come back again. You'll never work here again. And I said, I'm prepared to accept that. And he said, well, why? He said, you've got it made here. He said, you're young, you're vital, you've got benefits, you've got a good salary. You've got a good education, you can name your career path. Why would you ever leave? He said, all you have to do now is sit tight and write it out for another 30 years and you've got it made. And I said, that's precisely the kind of thinking that no longer serves me. Why would I choose to simply write it out when I could try something new that allows me a greater expression of my life. And it was very interesting for me because it was two very different kinds of thinking. In the generation that our director came from, there was a school of thought that said, you get in with a good company, you do all you can do to get there, and once you're there, you just hang on for dear life and ride it out with all the benefits. And you live your life on the weekends. And that's a path. It's not right, wrong, good, or bad, and it's simply a path. 